Okay. I'm going to call to order this regular meeting of the Board of Education for December 15th, 2021. Can we all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to point out our emergency exits in case we need to evacuate. It's the front of the library, the door that leads into the hallway, these two back um, corner doors that lead to outside. I'd like to welcome everyone in attendance and our viewers on the live stream. Just have a few opening remarks. Our district continues to focus on its mission of educating students, providing opportunities for extracurricular activities in the many diverse areas. Um, since our last meeting on 12-1, uh, education continues in all our core subject areas, our special ed areas, our CTE areas. And um, I just wanna highlight some of our uh, extracurricular events that, that enrich the student and staff experience. We've had music concerts. Our elementary concerts have been moved to March, but our winter concerts for middle school and high school are taking place last week, this week, and next week. We have uh, concerts in the gymnasium and in the auditorium. Uh, between uh, this meeting and the last, on Friday, December 3rd, we had the Village Holiday Parade. We had various music groups playing at locations along the village. Malta Avenue is having a SPAC dance residency, working with our students through February. There's gonna be a performance on February 15th, collecting toys for Toys for Tots. Their student council is very active, participated at the Holiday Trivia Night. Gordon Creek also had student council participation at the holiday trivia night. Milton Terrace doing a gift of warmth mitten tree. Science work there with our 4-H. Wood Roads gearing up for a school spirit week starting this Friday. And PTA and student council fundraisers are going on at all of our schools. Our middle school finished up a uh, November celebration of the contributions of native peoples, learning about rich, diverse cultures, traditions, and histories. At the early college high school, our junior year students are creating models of stormwater systems and very other interesting technological subject modeling. Our high school had their breakfast of champions. The administration and the PTSA celebrated ninth grade students who had a first quarter average of 95 or above. Congratulations to all those students on their hard work. Students donating their time uh, with the Boston Spa on Malta holiday closet event. Last Thursday, there was a student government fundraiser. It was a holiday trivia contest. It was here in the library. There were teams from our elementary schools, parent teams, it was a Board of Education team, and I think it showed the success of our educational programs as a, a team of high school students, after their many years of uh, education here in the district, came out the winners in the trivia contest with their, their knowledge. Uh, winter sports activities have commenced, games and matches are taking place with spectators present. I understand that there are still challenges out there. We wanna thank all our parents and caregivers who continue to be incredibly supportive of their students' learning by coming to these extracurricular events, by helping to provide transportation to said extracurricular <coughs> events, by providing transportation when we have selected routes that cannot be filled due to driver absences. Again, we have understanding that there have been some challenges along the way with this, we're doing our best to hire new drivers. There are radio ads now for district openings that you may have heard. 
And tonight in our resolutions, we have several new appointments to add new staff to our drivers. And I also want to conclude with thanking our parents and caregivers, our staff, students, and community members as we try and decipher the guidance and direction provided by the New York State Executive Branch, the Department of Health, and our Saratoga County. Certainly cognizant about this past Friday, new direction coming from the governor, other direction coming from the chairman of the County Board of Supervisors. The district has and will continue to consult with our legal counsel, state representatives, county officials, including the health commissioner, to get full understanding and clarification. Our goal that we have uh, continued to state since August is that we want to safely provide as much consistency and stability for all in the least restrictive environment that we can and to minimize the distractions that take away from fulfilling our primary mission of educating the students and providing opportunities for all the extracurricular activities that I mentioned. Again, thank you all for being here and attending on the live stream. First on our agenda is our recognition. Superintendent. Thank you very much. Uh, no formal recognition tonight, but Jason, really to dovetail into what you're saying, this last week uh, we ran, we were at the one third point of the year. Um, we ran our attendance data for our teachers and our teaching assistants in particular. Uh, both groups are between 95 and 96 percent uh, attendance at this point in the year. Uh, further refinement, we're fairly confident that that would probably go up uh, by another half uh, a point. This is remarkable. Uh, if you are not in schools right now, it is very difficult to understand the environment. It is incredibly difficult uh, getting coverage for teachers who need to take a day off allowing administrators to take the day off that they need as well it's very difficult because again there's so many things shifting each day positive cases quarantines exclusion potential new rules coming down variations that really uh, for us we rely on predictability and consistency we have had anything but and yet today principals just asking people to help with coverage people are flipping over doing what they have to do uh, this afternoon I spoke with administrators who will be covering classes this week so that we can keep our doors open keep the children uh, moving with their learning keeping families uh, so that they have minimal disruption as well it is a very fine balancing act right now uh, but to have our primary instructional staff uh, being here every day, delivering, supporting the students and supporting their families, having the administrators here every day to try to keep things moving forward, keeping things as light as possible. We just can't understate the value of that in this context. So uh, a very heartfelt thank you to all of our team uh, who just continues to show up and get the work done each day. Thank you, Superintendent Slimes. And certainly the um, the attendance numbers are very impressive and absolutely we send our thanks to uh, to all our staff we're at the time in our agenda for the first public comment period as I do for all of our meetings I will read our um, statement and guidance on our public comment the Board of Education welcomes district residents, parents, and other interested persons to its meeting. Community involvement at board meetings is encouraged so that the board can better understand and represent the views of its constituents. Please be aware, however, that information such as individual student information or particular personnel issues cannot be discussed at public sessions of the board. Speakers will be called upon individually. When recognized by the board president, will be asked to approach the podium and state your name and residence. Statements are restricted to a maximum of two minutes, and speakers will be notified by the board president when his or her time has expired. And I will reiterate, as I do, that I very much don't want to cut anyone off. I will 
share with you when you do get to the two minute um, period and please ask that you conclude your remarks. Uh, and we just wanna make sure that we give enough time for, for everyone to be able to be heard. The board and the district staff take public comment very seriously. However, the board will re not respond to comments or questions during the public comment period. A follow-up email will be sent, which is why we need to make sure that we have legible email addresses here, and we absolutely will, um, will follow up um, within just a few days to your comment. Uh, ask that you please um, do not uh, address any of the individual board members, but make your comments to the board as a whole. The board asks the public's cooperation, maintaining a safe and respectful environment. The board president reserves the right to limit individual comments if it is deemed necessary. To achieve this, speakers will not make slanderous attacks on any group, organization, or individual, a member of the board, an employee of the district, a member of the audience, or a member of the public. Use profane, vulgar, threatening, or other disparaging language or racial or ethnic slurs. Disrupt the meetings with loud outbursts or other disruptive conduct or behavior, either during the speaker's assigned time or at any other time during the meeting. Um, and none of that has ever happened at our meetings. Um, and we thank, thank our public for that. Speakers understand that a failure to comply with these rules for maintaining a respectful and productive environment may result in early termination of the speaker's <coughs> allotted time, denial of future requests to speak, any other actions deemed necessary by the president of the board, or if it's a health and safety measure, the superintendent of schools. So that said, I'm just going to use my phone for a timer and The first speaker is a uh, Marianne Priest. Who would please approach? State your name and address. Marianne Priest, Boston Spa, New York. Information released for the eighth grade Boston field trip surprisingly states vaccinated students are encouraged to room with other vaccinated students. This is mentioned twice within a single presentation. Sometimes extreme examples can show the abomination of a statement, so let me change the wording to this. Poor students are encouraged to room with other poor students. Seems wildly inappropriate, no? I have always felt that the district truly values student privacy, and this comes out. You are asking students to discuss and divulge private health information. This information will not change any potential outcome or alter decisions made on a single overnight trip. The question is asked again on the health questionnaire. Please don't go in the direction of pointing that the trip is optional and completely aware, but honestly, our students have missed enough required and optional pieces to their education over the last two years. As a district, we must do better. As a district, we talk about and do many things to promote inclusivity, gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, special education needs. Stop promoting the idea of vaccinated against the unvaccinated, especially when the vaccine is proving to be ineffective. I have also become aware that the school district soon would no longer provide on-site testing for unvaccinated adults as we need to retask those overseeing the service to testing of students. Not all COVID testing is free. Insurance companies can charge you if you are having, not having symptoms, you have not had an exposure. Are you asking employees to either pay out of their pocket for this or lie about the reason for the test, insurance fraud? Are these selected individuals now not receiving their full contractual compensation because of forced to pay for testing costs? Part of the federal funds received by the district are for testing students and employees. Treating those in education differently based on a choice they have does not send the message that the district also values everyone in education. Why would we continue to make decisions that further inconvenience and tax a segregated group of employees when we should cherish them all? Stop coercing employees into getting an ineffective vaccine, testing for all or none, and yes, the district should provide it. Educational innovator, Mr. Rogers, yep, from TV, once said the most important people in a child's life are that child's parents and teachers. That means parents and teachers are the most important people in the world, end quote. His words and ideas were always spot on. Stop promoting the vax against the unvax. This is segregation and discrimination among both children and adults within our district. Please do better. <laughs> Thank you for your comments, Ms. Priest. Next up, uh, Serena Richards.
Hi, Serena Richards, two Deerfield Place. I just want to say ditto to what Mary Ann said, 100% as a parent. Um, just a little background so you understand, I am a registered nurse, so I completely understand full heartedly how COVID has affected every single person. I have helped patients mentally, physically, and emotionally with this, so I understand. My purpose coming here today is um, received a call. My daughter does play on the JV basketball team and received a call that she had to go uh, into mandatory quarantine. She does not want the vaccine. I am vaccinated as a healthcare worker and my husband is as a healthcare worker. However, she wanted to take a personal choice not to be vaccinated and I respect that. Um, she, because she's not vaccinated, she cannot, she has, she has to be quarantined for those 10 days. And per Saratoga County, I called today to verify it. So it is up to date as today of 12:15 that kids or um, school or students can test out after five days and return on the eighth day. However, Boston Spa is not doing that. That's and not it correct. is that's not correct. If you would like, I looked on the website today and I looked through all of your emails. I could not find anything other. And I got the phone call from the nurse today to and somebody else that would be speaking after me will say the same thing. Yep. We got the nurse, her specific words. So obviously if that's not correct, the nurse is not aware as well, said that she's on quarantine until December 23rd and can return after midnight on December 24th. Obviously we don't have school, so she doesn't come back till after the new year. So if that's not correct, then your staff is not aware of it. And my, my reasoning it, or my going back and looking at this, Shen is doing it, Waterford's doing it, Boston Spa, we're not doing it as of right now per your website and email. So my concern and my problem is kids that aren't vaccinated can come to school if they're not having symptoms. It's a vaccinated versus unvaccinated. It's not fair to our kids. How was my daughter exposed to COVID? A vaccinated girl. A vaccinated girl got COVID. So let's return vaccinated kids though back to school and punish unvaccinated kids. It's not fair. Boston Spa needs to do better and we need to stop, as she said, segregating kids, vaccinated versus unvaccinated. And that's it, thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next on our list, Kristen Dolan. Hi everyone, Kristen Dolan. I live at 19th Century Drive in Malta. Um, I'm really just gonna reiterate what's been said by the previous two speakers. I will brought with me the updated version of the Department of Health where it does state that kids can test out of quarantine. And what I was asking is that basically Boston Spa adopt this policy. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if I could use my time since I'm standing up here, if you can let me know what the policy is that Boston Spa has adopted because I can't find it anywhere in black or white for my children to understand that they can come back to school. Yeah, th this is done through the county, uh, the, all communications, the testing protocol, everything is done through the county. Uh, tomorrow, we will send out an explicit note on this because it's clear that our communication hasn't been there. But yes, we've had a number of families who are utilizing the test out of quarantine process through the county. All of that has run quite efficiently for them. So yes, it is available. Okay, I appreciate that. And just to continue to use my time, I do ask you to recognize the lessons we are teaching our children in segregation and what we are doing to these children today. My kids want to be in school. They're multiple sport athletes. They wear their mask. They do everything they're asked to do. It is my choice that they are not vaccinated. It's not their choice. And they're being punished for it. They're going to miss school. It's actually their birthday next week. They're missing multiple basketball games. And I think it's terribly unfair when they are healthy, thriving children using to, that are being punished for a vaccine that doesn't prove that it keeps kids from getting COVID. I'm not saying COVID doesn't exist. I'm not saying it's um, the vaccine has its purpose. I'm just saying that we need to stop punishing our children because they are not, they are not doing anything wrong. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Dolan. Next 
up uh, Chris Dubuque. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the board. Chris Dubuque, Kaling Drive, Boston Spa. Um, still hearing a lot of passion of parents that are clearly affected by this. The kids are affected by this. Um, I'm here to offer some solutions. It's up to you as members of a board to either you know, take some constructive criticism, take these solutions, and then make the decision from there what you were going to do uh, with the information I'd like to provide tonight. Obviously, the rule that was out there, 2.60, recently was set to expire November 24th and just seemed to automatically renew with no emergency justification that I could see for why it couldn't be submitted for public comment. Um, that is a violation of due process. That is something that other schools have noticed. I'm sure this school has noticed as well. Um, fortunately, there was a group of schools that did band together and did end up submitting uh, documentation to Governor Hochul to seek clarification. And I think this is something that I'm sure everybody here would agree. It'd be nice if we had a standard operating procedure for all schools, for all counties, for the entire state as to how we handle these different situations uh, as they arise. Uh, it's Erie Niagara School Superintendents Association. They actually band together. There's 15 signatures, uh, signatures excuse me, of superintendents on this form. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing to you. They're, they're struggling out there. We fortunately have the option of uh, being or having the pilot program in South Glens Falls for the test to stay option. They were not given that option out in Erie and Niagara counties. Uh, so that's the majority of what this letter is requesting to have that option. Uh, I do want to just point out two sections I'd like to read to you from here is I think this would benefit our district as well, it would benefit our county as well, as well as other counties. Um, point number two they put on here is they just say, replace open-ended COVID-19 related mandates and restrictions with data and science-based metrics for implementation and de-implementation of mitigation strategies. Now, whether that's the masks, whether that's quarantining, um, whether that's closing down school due to uh, rising cases, whatever the case is, there should be a clear set policy of what's out there and what's established. And as you can hear tonight, it doesn't seem, you know, and, and communication issues do arise, I understand. But if there was just one set strategy for, again, all of New York and for various counties, I think that would be beneficial. It would make your job a lot easier as well. And ours trying to understand half this process. Uh, one more section I just want to read to you real quick on here that they had wrote very respectfully, but they had wrote here as well. Uh, more broadly, the New York State Department of Health must clearly outline for school districts and school communities a data-based approach that will result in developing off-ramp language for all COVID-related restrictions and requirements associated with school attendance. The time for open-ended and bluntly implemented mandates and restrictions for schools has long since passed. Uh, again, respectfully said. Yep, respectfully said, strongly worded. Uh, I would be more than happy to share the, this actual letter with the board. Uh, once I get email correspondence, I'll email this to you as well. Uh, and we'd be more than happy to put you in touch with uh, some of these superintendents uh, if you care to do so. Thank you. Yes, please email this. You have, Absolutely. You have my email address. If yep. You send it to me. Great. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our public comment. Um, Good evening, Jason Gertler, Rowland Street, Falson Spa. I would like to start off by saying thank you to uh, the board for what you do. Uh, congratulations to the new member of the board. Welcome. 
I would also like to say thank you to the Saratoga County Board of Supervisors for telling Kathy Hopel that they are not going to enforce a mask mandate. I would like to say thank you to the Saratoga County Public Health Commissioner for saying we are not going to enforce a mask mandate. I would like to say thank you to that board and that director for having some fortitude to stand up against what is right, for what is right. This board has not shown any backbone or fortitude. You have the power. Now the county <clears throat> is, what, 230,000 people in the county? It's a lot of people. And the directors of the county said, it's, it's cool, we're not gonna enforce it. How many students are in Boston Spa schools? 4,000? A lot less, right? A lot less people in the school. So, you know, this is ridiculous. You have the power to do what's right. I suggest you do it. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Mr. Gerber. Okay. Um, now on our agenda, we have our student government report. We have Chris and Emily. Hello, I'm Emily. I'm the president of student government. I will be giving a brief report on what we have going on holiday-wise. December 2nd, 3rd, 4th, and 5th, student government members volunteered at the Holiday Closet event. We uh, drove around, picked up items, and we also helped organize them. At the Malta Ambulance, we helped people who came to shop, and they were all so gracious and thankful for everything we had done and helped and helped put together this wonderful event that saved a lot of people's Christmases. So I was very thankful we were able to help with that. We also had holiday trivia last week. We had so much fun. We raised a lot of money that is all going right back into the community. We are going shopping this weekend for items for stockings for teenagers. We are pairing up with Interact Club, who set up this idea, and we're donating 10 to 15 stockings from the money we made off of trivia, trivia and donating them to teenagers, teenagers in our school who otherwise wouldn't get anything. So that is a, a nice thing we're able to do. And Chris has another report. Uh, I'm Chris Style. I'm the Vice President of Student Government. Um, so next week we have our Holiday Spirit Week, and we're pretty excited about that. To see the participation we get from that from the high school, and I know it went down to the other schools as well. So we're just excited to see what's coming. <coughs> That's what we have. Uh, great job on trivia the other night. The energy that was there, you just made it a, a lot of fun for everyone. So thank you both. Yeah, and one of the great things about the trivia night was that we had uh, teams from the elementary student councils, we had parents involved, um, we had other teachers involved. It really brought uh, quite a few members of the community together. And I think you should mention, Chris, the, the red uh, footwear that you were wearing. I would say after the event, the red elf shoes showed up on many people's Christmas lists, <laughs> asking Santa for those afterwards. <laughs> you should, Chris. Thank you. Is thank you it? both. Yes. yes, thank you very much. Uh, next on our agenda, approval of minutes. May I have a motion to approve the minutes of the December 7th, 2021 special meeting? So moved. Second. <clears throat> Any amendments or additions? Any discussion? 
Not hearing any. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? The minutes are approved. Next on our agenda, our superintendent's report. Superintendent Slentz. Thank you, sir. Uh, two items for you tonight, uh, both very much in line with one another. Uh, we will start out with uh, this year's budget goals, or, or I should say the budget goals for next school year's budget. Uh, we started this process, you'll recall, in October. Uh, we finalize it with the vote uh, that is scheduled for May 17. Uh, so for tonight, uh, really an overview of how we are tying things together, uh, a quick look at our strategic goals, and then we will focus on one in particular, which is our long-range financial planning. Um, you know, given what we opened with, the context that we are in in schools right now, I think it's more important than ever to have these reminders about the work that we have in front of us. Um, these kids have so many opportunities, but at the same time, so many challenges uh, that again, as I noted, our folks continue to step up to offer. Uh, as much as we would like to say, let's give everybody a break, let's slow down, let's back off, our kids can't afford that, right? They still have to move through their respective grade levels. They still have to hit the finish line in graduation with that meaningful diploma. So the work does continue. And again, within our mission and certainly within our vision, this emphasis on the partnership. I don't know as though we've had a year where we've had to rely on that partnership so heavily and so it sits prominently within our mission statement, certainly within our, our vision. Uh, you're all familiar with this. Uh, and again, how we bring this to life is what's really critical. I don't think anyone would disagree that this is what we want for our children. How we bring it to life, how we finance it, how we resource it really is critical. And so we'll get into some more details there. This I shared with you last year, and, and the research is just so consistent on this. And I'm not talking about recent research. I'm talking about decades of research. There are two critical components of successful schools. The first is that you have a curriculum that is rich and rigorous, understood and well delivered by your staff. And then you have to have this pervasive belief that what I did today was good, but I know tomorrow can be better. And for us to be able to provide the support mechanisms have them in place, build the school climates and cultures such that this is just the work that we do. We work to get better every day, delivering the curriculum across a variety of content areas. And so our strategic points of focus, again, these are not new to you. Uh, the first one, again, sits in it, its rightful place based on what we just talked about. The curriculum development and implementation. The instruction, how do we effectively and continuously get better at delivering uh, the curriculum? How do we make sure that we have assessments uh, that again have validity and reliability such that we can put a stamp on the meaning of the data that we get from them? The positive student behavior and wellness, this itself is a separate curriculum. We cannot assume that children show up to us ready to behave in certain ways. If we expect certain behavior, we have to make sure that it's explicitly taught. All of this taken together gives students that opportunity to know that I'm good at something. I know how to do the work. This is something I'm interested in. I can pursue this. That contributes to that overall sense of wellness. The personnel. We are a personnel heavy industry. And so we want to make sure that we have the best in the business at our fingertips and exposed to our children. This is something that, again, oftentimes we some, we're guilty of saying, geez, maybe if we had this type of teacher, maybe if we had this type of administrator, if that's what we want, it's our job to grow them that way. Hire people who are good and ready and willing to learn and get them good. That's our job, and we have to resource that accordingly. Communications, we talked about that tonight. One of our biggest flaws is that we think we communicate well. That's not always true. So this is something that we have to continuously work on. And as Brian will talk to you about uh, in a bit, the long range planning, particularly the financial and the facilities piece in particular. So out of this, we established our priorities for the year. Obviously our first one uh, always is student and staff wellness and safety. Uh, we're pretty good on safety right now. I worry terribly about our collective wellness. Uh, there's a lot of stress and strain in the system. 
Uh, we have work to do there. We want to get our folks uh, to and through next Thursday and give them a, a much needed break. Uh, the equitable access to learning uh, and, and the opportunities that we provide for our students. I'll show the slide that you've seen before in a moment uh, about the various pathways that we offer to graduation. That is not a senior year activity. That is not a junior year activity. That starts with our UPK programs and builds all the way through based on the components that we've already talked about. Making sure that the curriculum, uh, again, is supported by high quality instructional materials. That's becoming an unfortunate buzzword and it's losing meaning. But there is a difference between high quality and average quality instructional materials. Time and time again, you want our students to improve, give them an excellent teacher that is supported by high quality materials. Who determines high quality materials? We're so fortunate that we know so much more today than we did even 10 years ago. There are nonprofit companies out there who do evaluation of materials relative to standards, relative to how children learn, relative to the needs of students with disabilities, English language learners. They vet these things for us. We have to use the tools then to determine which one of those curricula, which of those high quality materials are going to be best for us. When we look at the, the culture of, for support of continuous improvement that we talked about, we have to explicitly build that. That is not something that comes from hope. You have to resource that and focus on it. And then again, the constant focus on better communication. And so again, this is something that if we expect students to meet certain standards, we have to explicitly teach it. We have to assess it. We have to evaluate where our students are being successful and where they need assistance. How do we do that? We build systems that support it. We put personnel in place that are trained to deliver on this, and we keep getting better at what we do. All of these things right now are in some form of motion within the district. We still, despite our best intentions, our community support of literacy, that's a project that we still don't have up and going. Uh, we're ready for it. We have it framed. It's just one thing leads to another each day. The rest of these things that we now have in place, they're contributing to the success of our students. When we aren't successful with our students, what do we do? We have to have a systematic approach to that. And it has to be very thoughtfully done, driven by strong assessments, targeted instruction that the children need to get them right back to the classroom, right back to that tier one instruction that we've talked about before that every one of our children deserves. The more time they spend away from that tier one curriculum, the more they're disadvantaged as they go down the road. When we look at all of the different pieces that we have in place here, that we have built uh, with the instructional staff and with the administrators over the course of the last three years, this is making a difference for our students. This is helping them stay as close as possible to that tier one curriculum. And sitting at the heart of this, we have to do a better job of clearing the path for principals to be able to support their teachers in making the strong instruction happen in the delivery of the curriculum, in the implementation of that multi-tiered system of supports when our students don't learn the curriculum to the level of expectation that we need. There are support structures around this, support structures that we want to add to in the upcoming budget, particularly in special mm -hmm. education and in the area of technology. And we'll talk more about that as we go on uh, in the budgeting process. And this is what I was referencing before. For a district of our size, all of these opportunities for our students that we start building preparation for beginning with UPK and every year being very intentional and very explicit about how we're going to give as many kids as possible access to every one of these. After uh, what we saw now three meetings ago, perhaps a little bit longer, we've added the additional one down here with the New York State Seal of Civil Civic Readiness. This combination, the seal of bioliteracy, the seal of civic readiness, all of this comes from the instruction and the access uh, to that high quality instructional materials at the elementary, which is going to feed into the emerging middle years uh, international baccalaureate program that gives <coughs> them the level of readiness for this that they deserve, that our families need, that our students, when they walk across the stage, have to expect from us. But again, we have to be very intentional about how we design our readiness for this. 
And so our draft goals uh, for the year, uh, again, you'll see the level of specificity here in terms of what, by when, and, and by whom is getting done. Uh, the curriculum development and implementation, again, I know everyone is tired. I know we need uh, occasionally to take our foot off the gas. We have to be so thoughtful about the impact of that on our students and their learning year over year, where those gaps are, where those deficits are. We can't afford to take our foot off the gas too much or too often because it's a disservice to our kids. Our staff knows that. The attendance numbers show that. The work that's happening in the classroom every day shows that. But this is something that, again, is so critical to their success in achieving that meaningful diploma. So again, you've seen these before. I want to skip to one uh, that's really important in the focal point for tonight. Uh, by January of 2022, uh, Brian's an overachiever. Um, we wanted to have our long range financial plan updated. Uh, it is now officially updated and Brian's going to walk you through that in just a moment to give you an idea of where our budget sits within that, the work that we still have to do to refine that, to get us into uh, a balanced uh, budget. And so within that, how do we make sure that not only within this year, but in that long range plan, we start to accommodate all the things that we've talked about uh, thus far looking at uh, what we need in terms of the implementation of the curriculum that we've already adopted, that we've trained for, that we continue to invest in at K-5, continuing to build the model of a true middle school that is tailored for the age group of a middle school, not a junior high school. That middle years IB program is so important to continue the learning and the opportunities that the children have in elementary to get them ready then for that handoff to have access to all of those pathways at the high school level. Continuing to build different models within the high school to make sure that we are providing opportunities to every one of our students, to make sure that we can keep them in school in a variety of different settings that we noted within that larger model. The instructional technology piece of it. You know, this is something that we have to be very intentional about. We went for a long time as school districts spending millions and millions of dollars on technology and we really didn't have a measurable outcome on student learning. We have to be much more intentional about how we do that now. And so that's uh, part of what we're moving forward with as well. This last piece is, is really important and this is something that we continue to work on. Uh, the district school climate and culture project. That's something that we've had a lot of work done behind the scenes. We've talked about uh, with you folks. We just got some really excellent feedback from a teacher group on this. And so in future meetings, you'll hear more about that. Uh, budget goal two, again, this is the MTSS system. What do we do when our children don't learn to the level of expectation? We have to be ready to respond systematically. We have to do targeted instruction based on those valid and reliable assessments to give children every opportunity to get right back on track with that tier one curriculum, whether that's in behavioral curriculum or academic curriculum. That's something that we're making a lot of investments in. More training is going on. Still, this is something, this is a, a three-year program in terms of getting everyone ready for it. In terms of uh, our, our third goal, this is where we're supporting the, the, the recruitment, the development of our staff. How do we make sure that they're ready for that implementation of curriculum? How do we give them every opportunity possible to get better at what they do? The research is daunting in this regard. It is very consistent that says after the fifth year, teacher talent and improvement tends to flatten out. How do we resist what the research, decades of research has, has told us? And that's not a criticism of teachers. This is simply once you get into the routine how do we make sure that we're giving every teacher the opportunity to get better, to create the safe space for learning so that they meet that expectation of continuously getting better? The same thing for our administrators. How do we leverage the opportunities that we're giving them such that we can free principals up to do more <coughs> instructional guidance? How do we make sure that each of our directors has the resources necessary to meet every one of those criteria that we set out before to give every one of our students opportunities to access those pathways. 
looking at our APPR plan. That is indeed a four-letter word, as it's been over the last several years. This is something that we've worked very closely uh, with both the administrators and the teachers to uh, submit a variance to the State Education Department that allows us to do it differently such that we are focusing on developing better feedback. All teacher scores now are attached to the Regents' exam. Why is that? Because Regents' exam are not a senior high thing alone. They start in UPK and they build up to that. So this is something that's been very helpful and we're grateful for the partnership uh, of both organizations, the Teachers Association as well uh, as the Administrators Association. Goal four, continue to support, speaking of, the collective bargaining agreements that we have in place. Uh, as you'll see in a moment, all of our collective bargaining uh, agreements are in place right now. We have no open contracts. Uh, looking at, again, how do we continue to make sure that we are staying ahead uh, of the curve, we're staying proactive in how we manage our facilities, our systems, uh, making sure that our processes are as refined as they can be uh, relative to our facilities. And then again, finally, looking at some of the staffing changes uh, that are going to need to be made uh, to be able to support the things that we've talked about up to this point. All of these things, again, the steps that we're taking, uh, looking at that balance that is always a challenge. There's so many things that we want to do with and for our children, but we also know that there, there are finite resources there. The best possible program within the confines of the taxpaying community. That's what it boils down to. Looking at those long range plans we've talked about before, taking the peaks and valleys out of our resourcing. How do we do that? Brian's going to walk you through that in, in a moment. Maximizing those aidable services. Is there a way that we can actually leverage those contracts, leverage those services in such a way that we drive revenue back to the district? Looking at our pilots, Brian will talk about in a moment, you're all aware of the global pilot that's in place right now. Once a great source of revenue for us, now it's, it's quite the opposite. And then advocating, we're finally at the point where the foundation aid formula is running. We will be the beneficiaries of that this year. We, will, we were last year, we will be this year, we certainly are again next year. But this is something that tends to ebb and flow as the state coffers ebb and flow. This is something that we want to continue to advocate for. As I noted, all of our contracts are currently in place. Uh, healthcare costs will always be a, a challenge for us. Brian will talk about that. ERS and TRS, the, these are the employer contribution rates. Uh, speaking of peaks and valleys, they've been up, down, and everywhere in between over the last 10 to 15 years. You can see what they're projected to be now. And then the debt service that, again, Brian will talk about in a moment. We'll get into more uh, depth on this at our next presentation on January 5th. Um, but let's talk about uh, long range planning after we see if there are any questions on this. I have a couple of questions. Ken, can mm -hmm. you go back one slide, please? Just to make sure we understand the, the detail here on the, the retirement system yep. projections. What is that 10 and 10.5%? It'll be between, they're off, estimating no, what it'll be. What is, is, is that what our contribution is based off of like a total contribution based for off the of district? Salaries. Correct. Based off of the salary. Yes. Okay. For those in, in the teacher retirement system, that's administrators and teachers. Yeah. And that's the pure number, not an increase from the prior year. Prior year, Brian, we were at four. Nine point eight. So this is an current year that we're at. Okay. So it's a small increase. Thank you. And then the other thing I had, um, we don't need to go to the slide, but on the multi-tiered system of support. So as you say, that is, that is the safety net. That is the work that brings our students back to um, the regular instruction, back to tier one. <clears throat> Besides the program itself, um, we need to make sure that we have built in the measuring apparatus yep. so that we see our success failure rate see how long students stay in the specific tiers you know it's the kind of program where we want to make it obsolete our success is when students move up from right. the the tiers but we need to be sure we measure that and have reporting on that mm -hmm. because we want to be able to track the um, efficacy of it and whether or not we are meeting our goals yeah. 
in which case we may need to, to shift or, or change direction. Yeah, and that's something uh, we just finished with our, uh, I guess it was probably a week, week and a half ago, we just finished with our first uh, cycle meetings, as we call them at the elementary, where you can look at the uh, number of, of students in red, those in yellow, those in green, and ultimately those in blue. We can tell you for our tier three students, for example, how many kids tested out and so they're back in a tier one, tier two model. We have all of that data from each of our schools uh, if you all would like to see uh, a presentation on that. It's, uh, it's pretty exciting for what the teachers have been able to do and certainly what the, the children are demonstrating. I would offer that it's probably something that we would like an update on, you know, potentially quarterly or every couple of months, whatever is the proper cycle. Because yep. I, I think, again, that really um, shows us one of our, our key levers, one of our, 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 our key foundational things, how we're doing in that area. Yep. Agreed. Does that work for everyone on the board? Yes. Okay. That's all I had on yours. Um, any other board members' questions, comments? Anything on the presentation? All right. Let's go over to the long range financial plan. Okay, I'm going I'm to stand up. Okay. I have a clip or two, so quite right. So good evening, everyone. Um, tonight, uh, for the you know, really the the first major presentation of the budget season, uh, I'm going to be presenting the uh, long range plan. Uh, the last time we updated this was two years ago. It represents a large amount of work spread over the last six months by the business office and by the various um, companies that we work with, whether it's our our borrowing advisors, um, our architects, uh, you name it. There's a lot of folks and a lot of uh, involvement uh, to bring this all together. So uh, without any ado here, let's go right into this. Just to give you a sense of uh, some definitions, what are we doing here? Well, it's uh, really a technical analysis. It's really structures is the way I look at it within the budget. Uh, it's a five-year projection and you know, even when you're doing a budget, the next year's budget and we're working on in the next three months, you're actually projecting a budget that you don't have an idea of something that's going to happen the following year into the following uh, spring of that same school year. And yet, in this case, we're trying to go out five years. It's important to do for a lot of reasons, and I'll be talking about that. Um, and in, in the case of, uh, you know, our situation here, it, it's possible to be pretty darn accurate over time. When we did this two years ago, some of our years, like 2026, 24, in 2024, we're within um, our, our budget gap, which I'll talk about. We're within uh, less than fifty, a hundred thousand dollars difference than than what they came up again this time. So, uh, with a lot of work involved, we can get to that level of accuracy, and um, hopefully, this one, this particular one, will uh, last as long and be as accurate. Um, ultimately, what this plan, though, and it says this with at, at the bottom here, what this plan is meant to do is to help fulfill the mission. In any one year, you can have difficult fiscal years and you can have easier fiscal years. And as you're planning the instructional uh, programs and initiatives, if you're going to have a, a difficult budget year, it's helpful to know that in advance. And that's the idea behind this, is to let us know where we're going to stand even two, three, four, five years out and, and then plan around that. And so it really is actually the core of, of everything that we do. So uh, anybody who's familiar with doing a, um, a forecast like this, you'll see those types of uh, categories. And we go through all this process uh, in the business office to get all of this together. And I'm going to just keep going right into this. The, uh, the national economic conditions, I mean, clearly they're a lot different than, they, than when they were two years ago. Um, and you know that's one of the, the things is you, you can't tell what's going to change. Um, thankfully, uh, the, the school district and every school district in the country received additional funding from the federal government during this process, and that has helped a lot. Um, but just looking at these, these standard types of items that we deal with, medical insurance, 
Uh, the school district, like most school districts, runs below the national average uh, for annual increases because the populace of school districts, uh, the, the staff, tend to be healthier um, than the average population. So one of the things that we do is we belong to a consortium of other school districts. We do not belong to a consortium that has uh, police officers, uh, firemen, construction workers, you name it. If you think of all the different jobs out there, it's not a part of that. And that's why we're able to stay low on this. And you'll see in a minute uh, some of those numbers. Um, energy is something that uh, we've had a, a great advantage here because we have our own uh, electrical plant here that was put in in 1998, I think, or 2000. And we just uh, um, renovated that whole facility under the last project and it is uh, in full capacity now. And we have long range uh, um, contracts for natural gas. So currently we're not being affected by that increase in natural gas that a lot of people are seeing because of our long term contracts. Um, but inflation, we know that inflation is coming and that's a part of what we might see over the next couple of years as our contracts run out, we may have to pay more for our natural gas. The natural gas runs the facility that then generates the electricity. Um, I mentioned federal grants. That was a huge help this year and last year and will be for the next two years. Um, we're getting money that is offsetting the costs associated with um, anything related to the pandemic. Um, reform initiatives and, you know, this is what meant at the national level many years ago. Um, you know, the different, you hear all the different kinds of ideas that come from the federal government about how they're going to reform education. Invariably, they go on for three or four years and then they kind of slowly go away and then the next thing comes in. The thing is, is that can drastically affect our grants and it can affect the, the program that we have to offer. Right now, there aren't really any federal um, initiatives that are changing uh, uh, our, our need to, to address them. So uh, in New York State, in particular, um, state aid. This, this, is, this is really a, a huge item for us. We are now seeing the run of the foundation aid. We got it in the, in the current fiscal year. Uh, we're going to see it again next year, and we're going to see supposedly again the following year. All depends on New York State and its, its financial health. Um, and right now, though, the governor has made a commitment to do it. And we, were all, we, were over, we would have been $4 million behind in our aid. Uh, you know, at this point, if, if that had not happened, if they had not started to run these formulas again. The foundation aid is a formula, it's a very complex formula that includes all kinds of elements from um, uh, everything from your, the, the demographics of the students and the wealth of the students, the wealth of the families, the, the property in your district, the number of kids you have, uh, all, many different combinations and go into this to, to develop this. It had been stopped by uh, Governor Cuomo and was just, it was basically turned into a political accommodation in the sense that if you got, I'm just gonna make something up, if you got $20 million in foundation aid, the next year you get 2% more for that. And then the next year after that, you get 2% more. And that's the way it went for almost a decade. And that ignored the fact that many school districts were getting, relative to other school districts in the state, richer or poorer, and should have gotten either more money or less money. And that's a, a, a fair distribution, in my opinion, of how the, the funds should be distributed. That didn't happen for a long time, and we were way behind on that. And, and now we, we're going to supposedly get caught up in the next three years. It makes this uh, forecast um, much nicer than the prior ones in the sense that uh, we're, we're, in, we're in better shape. Uh, the housing market in the area is healthy. Uh, Saratoga County is one of the fastest growing counties in the state, if not the, the fastest. And, um, both in terms of new construction and in terms of uh, property value, so that's good news. Uh, commercial expansion is solid. Um, you know, since the plant went in, the Global Foundries plant, we've seen a lot of construction, particularly in the, you know, 17, 18, 19 years. Um, that's kind of slowed down now, but uh, they're moving uh, in a direction as if you read the news, you know that there could be another plant, there could be other facilities at that, uh, at that uh, location, so we'll see how that plays out. Um, employment. Uh, I wrote the word weird uh, on my notes here because employment is strange um, right now. As we all know, is the issue of um, you know, finding people to do various jobs. And the school district is being hit by this heavily. Every school district is. And, it's, and, it, and I go into length in this in, in the, the actual report. Uh, and of course, we all know about the bus driver situation, but it's beyond that. It's also we have issues finding cleaners. We have issues finding certain uh, instructional positions. And of course, we're having find, uh, trouble finding uh, nurses. And these are all the things that, you know, we need right now. 
and we can't find them and there's nobody out there. The, the, the change in the, in the labor market is tough um, and we're just a piece of that and um, again, if we go into the report, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So uh, for a school district, you know, the most significant expenditure area is, is salary and staffing. We are a uh, service industry in that sense. And so that's right on top. And of course, correlated with that is employee benefits. And then another big area for us is uh, the debt service for all of our projects. So these are the areas that are gone into in depth in the report. Um, by the way, the report is on the website if anybody wants to see it there, but you guys have access to it and I've given you a copy, okay? Um, significant revenues, uh, obviously state aid and property taxes, it's you know 90% of the, uh, the revenue that we get is between those two items. The pilot payment we're gonna talk about some more. Uh, so those are the major categories. But let's start out with you know the, the population of the students because that drives everything. It drives how much aid we get, it drives how much staff we need to have, how many buses we need to have, it drives everything. So uh, we contract with the, um, down here it's the Capital District Regional Planning Commission, which is uh, an agency in Albany that uh, does our projections for us. They've done pretty well uh, over the last 15 years. They've done the projections for us. They've been pretty accurate. Some years they've been a few off. Some years they've been you know, 10 or 15 kids off. Um, so not too bad. They tend to lag just like any kind of a projection like this. The projection lags the actuality. And so, for example, they actually, um, had us in this year at about 39.90. So we actually have more kids than what they projected. So you have to be careful of that and, and it's a part of this whole process. Uh, we, we take the, the, any kind of projection like that with a grain of salt. So another internal assumption is the, the health insurance premiums. The district spends about uh, a little over $15 million a year on health insurance and dental. And um, this is a, um, projection of where we think those numbers are going to be. Um, we're significantly less, like I said, than the general uh, population. And, but even then, our numbers now, compared to what they were uh, about 15 years ago, where we were seeing 10, 12% increases in health insurance, if everybody remembers that time, particularly in the mid-2000s, uh, uh, it was jumping dramatically and it was having an impact on all uh, organizations. Every employer was getting hammered with this. So what you do is you, you, you go on and you try to manage that and the report goes into depth on how we've managed that with both our unions and the mix of items that we offer as far as health insurance and uh, how much the unions pay for that and the employees pay for that. And uh, it's been, a, it's been a, a, actually a positive experience for everyone, even, even the, the employees, because they have good choices uh, and less expensive choices if they want them. Um, this, these percentages here are not the uh, percentages that employees pay or anything like this. This is how much the, the, co the, the premium is going up every year and then we share that with employees. Out over time, in the consortium that we belong to, the average right now is about 5.2% over the last five years. If you went back 15 years, it'd be almost 8%. So very different and we're like the, the general uh, state of uh, health insurance in the country. In fact, I was reading something recently. There's a projection. I looked at what is the what our employers projecting for 23, which most of them have a, a fiscal year that ends uh, December 30th, and it's about five and a quarter to five and a half. So if I look at that for us, th we're we're about right here. So that's good news. Now, uh, CDPHP, by the way, is a community-rated plan, and therefore it does include a lot more uh, groups of people besides uh, employees, uh, school employees. So that one is a little bit higher, and you can see that. That one's been kind of going away as uh, employees have shifted away from that, but it is an offering of an HMO. So um, debt service. And this is uh, very complex when you have an outstanding project like we do. So we, you know, in 2018, the voters uh, approved phase three of the building uh, project uh, going back to, uh, I think it was 2011. And uh, that was for about uh, $24 million. And this is the debt service that for all the things that have happened for the last 30 years, some of this debt that you see up here under existing can go back you know, 15, 20, 30 years, and those are the, the payments that are ongoing. This right here is the new debt associated with the new project, and you can see that next year it's not much of a change, but then the following year we're gonna issue ban, or excuse me, bonds, and at that point the number jumps up dramatically and then stays like that for about 12 years. 
Um, countering all this, though, of course, is the building aid that the school district gets, and this is from the state, and then that is offset, and that's a revenue. So our projects are, the, are aided at about 74%, 74 to 75%, so you know, that's good news in the sense that the state picks up that, that 75%. And away we go. We've also been able to, uh, in this uh, round of uh, projects, we were able to get an additional grant from NYSERDA for about $800,000 um, because of the uh, cogeneration plant. So they came in, and, and we haven't gotten that. We've gotten two thirds of that now. They're still. They have to come in, and they actually test the plant, and they and they they check is it actually uh, resulting in the savings that it's supposed to say uh, is supposed to result in, and. Um, then right now we believe that the, it, it is, and they'll they'll finish up that whole uh, amount of uh, aiding, and that's a great thing because that's not coming out of uh, local dollars. So there's building aid um, and the net. Okay, so let's talk about um, the Global Foundries pilot. Um, it started in 2013 and and grew and then uh, has been going away each year. The original plant was uh, assessed at about $650 million. You know, you hear the numbers of, you know, 14, you know, 13, 14 billion. That includes all of the equipment that's in there, all the big equipment that actually makes the chips. That is not accessible uh, in, a, in the sense of property and in, in, in a, in a, in a property tax. So the only amount that was accessible in that was the shell of the building and the property that was in it was $650 million. Um, it's been going down since then. So in uh, 2023 that we're going to be going at, it'll be at 382, and it'll go down about $43 million. Um, you know, it, what this results in is about a half a million dollars a year that we lose in revenue. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's a significant amount, and it is impacting us every day. On the other hand, um, you know, we, we have to say that we're very lucky to have this plant. And also, we hope that we have the, uh, a second one someday if, if that works out, because um, it helps all of the taxpayers in the area and the school district um, for funding. So we take all those pieces that, you know, and I've just given you um, certain charts out of the 30-page document that you have. And um, we take all that, and then we look at it. We look at historical uh, percentages of change. We look at what may change even, you know, history. That's, that's kind of that lag thing. If anybody does forecasting, understand that if you look backwards, you're going to lag what, you're, what really is going to happen. So you have to always modify that with more information of what you know is, is out there. So when I look at this, um, you know, the, there's the pilot payment change. That's all pilots, not just global. Um, but most of the pilots stay the same, but global is the one that's, that's doing the, the, the decrease. In state aid, um, we should see a large increase. Look at this 10.6% uh, increase in foundation aid, which is about $2 million for next year uh, if they follow the, you know, the plan. We'll, we'll see. We, we're, this was built in here given that we believe there's a high probability that it'll happen. We won't know until January 30th or not even there to know for sure whether the governor is going to make that proposal or not. Um, then we go out after that, foundation aid should become more, uh, more like uh, the, the way it used to be because we had to catch up and now we'll go back to some kind of an inflationary item. So I won't go through all of these. Each, each of these things is described and, and explained in, in the actual document. But these are the various aids that we get. You can see that we're going to get some large increases in building aid because of that debt. So the, the building aid comes on the same time that you issue your bonds and your bans. So that comes on. That's why those large numbers are there. Um, you go down into here. Uh, for the term of this, the, like it was in the last time, we projected uh, 3%. Uh, for 2020, you know, two, it was about 1.9%. And in fact, in the last time that we did this projection two years ago, we used 3% as the projection, but we never came close to that. We were generally 0.9, 1.9% in the levy increase. It's important to understand this because um, one is is that we're taxing under the amount that we can, and, and we all know that we do that in the in the you know, the budget presentation every year. We talk about what the tax cap is versus what we actually tax at, and we're significantly under that. And um, but what happens too is is that in the town of Malta, for example, the tax rate went down this year. So instead of losing five hundred thousand dollars from the global plant, we lost about six hundred thousand. Because the rate, you know, if the rate goes down, you're going to lose more money because it's just like it's a calculation, just like a, a property tax. 
So the rates actually went down in, in I think, three of the four towns. So we actually lost more money in global. And, and so it's something that we know, we take into account, and, and we work on this um, you know, in any projection, anything we're doing. So um, that's, that's uh, a summary of that and how it goes out. Um, we do the same thing on the expense side. We look at you know, the salaries. We look at um, all the, the benefits is a big category. You can see I mentioned medical insurance. Here's the 15 million. Um, you go down, BOCES is a big, is a big uh, amount. Uh, this one is basically driven by uh, special ed, which is a, the increase that you see here. Normally, without that, it's a small increase. Um, same thing with uh, contracted services here. There's a big increase for 2023 because of special education and uh, the private schools that some of these kids have to go to for the medically uh, disabled. Yes. What's the, lar the, the large negative? What, what's where right here? The minus 24.5. ERS to uh, your ERS. Oh, yeah, so uh, ERS, uh, you know, um, Jason asked about this earlier. So <coughs> TRS is going up a little bit, about 4%, but ERS is going down 28%. That's, oh. that's the percentage change. So it's going from 16.9 to, uh, what was the number, 11.6, .6, I believe. So big decrease there. Oh. So when you work that all through, the, the netting of all that, it's actually a large decrease in the retirement number. Okay. Gotcha. So yeah, so it's, it, you know, and this is one of those things where uh, next year it could be the reverse. And, and it's really troublesome for school districts because they're using their own actuarial uh, folks who, who do projections and have to show how much revenue they're going to get. And they're having to do this under a, a microscope of their auditors. But what it means is, is that they never level out anything. They're, they're, they're going like this. And school districts would much prefer that level number that you could plan for. Well, you know, I guess this, this is good news for one year, all right? Uh, the last year it went up 10%, you know, the, going into 22. So w in order to project this, we can't, we can't possibly know. They don't know what it is going to be out. They won't release the data, and, and who knows what they know. So what we do is we take this and we align it with the salaries because it's the percentage of the salaries. And that's how uh, those projections go up. But we know next year that that change is, is specific, okay? Yep. Okay, uh, next. So after you take those percentages and you look at the base year, which is uh, the current year that we're in, fiscal 22, um, you, you see those numbers now. Taking all those percentages you saw, it builds the budget out on all these categories. So there's the build out on revenue. Now, uh, importantly, uh, in revenue, the numbers range from about 1.9 to 3.8% um, increases, okay, uh, depending on the year. Uh, then you go and you do the same thing for your expenses. So again, we start with fiscal 22, and then you apply those percentages and you go out. Now here, though, the range of increases goes from 2.4 to 4.3. So something's got to give, and it does every year when we go and we develop the budget and we reduce expenses from uh, the initial estimates or the initial costs. So what does that lead to? And this is, this is the, the final piece of a, of a long-range financial plan, is you do your gap analysis. You, you've developed your revenues, now you're looking at your expenses and you're comparing them, and you say, okay, well, where do we stand? Well, this is what this thing tells us, those numbers that you just saw, culminate in these, these deficits. Now, these deficits like this are not true because what eventually happens is we're required to have a balanced budget. So between now and April, our job will be to essentially build this budget in detail and eliminate that deficit. So the following year, it really won't be 921, it'll be 557. And so what you have to do is you have to pull out the prior years to get your deficit. And here is your annual gap right here, okay? So for 2024, there is a, there's a smaller gap, all right? And the reason for that is, is that we've got um, state aid coming on for uh, the building and uh, the additional state aid and foundation aid. So the gap is not as big as it normally, it usually runs about a million dollars. If, if you saw the presentation from two years ago, I said, we've got a million dollar annual structural uh, uh, a budget deficit. So there's a typical year, and there's about a million dollars. <coughs> Here, okay, 2026, how come it's less? Well, in this case, we have some debt service that is coming off, that is gonna finish up its 20 year span or 30 years of payments, and so then there's a lower gap. And then finally we go back to a normal year, and it's a little bit higher there. 
that's how we understand that's, that this is critical right here because now we understand where we stand for the next four or five years. Okay, so let's look at that and, and just, you know, again, I have to say I, I, I don't like to, to maybe emphasize the negative part of the global uh, uh, pilot because it's a, a huge positive for us, uh, the school district I I specifically, but if it's going away at $500,000 a year, and like I said, this year it was 600000 um, you can see if you take those budget gaps and you add back the money that's being lost in global, you can see then what the real budget gaps are, all right, without that. So we'd in fact have um, a positive uh, number here for the current year, for the upcoming fiscal year, and you can see how much smaller they are. Now, that's not going to happen because, you know, global's there, and this, these could be much bigger because there's going to be, uh, it could be a higher. If our tax rates go down, which is, is very possible, how do our, one of the important points about how do our tax rate go down, the growth in new construction in the area in, within the school district's boundaries is very high. We're the highest in the region because of global. And so if it goes, if you have a tax rate that's, let's say, 2.5%, uh, and you have 1.5% uh, of new growth, then essentially the tax rate is only going to change by about 1%. All right? So if you, only, if you go out with, let's say, a 1.5% tax levy increase, but new construction is 2%, your tax rates just went down by half percent. And I think that um, most of you know that you know uh, everybody, not everybody, but most people, if there wasn't a revaluation of their house, they got a small decrease this year compared to the prior year. Um, and, but Global did too, only their small decrease is $100,000. So that's something that you know, we take into account and we look at. Um, so that, that helps you understand you know, the, 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 the gap analysis is the end, end all and be all what we're trying to get to. We're trying to figure out where do we stand relative to those two numbers. The budgets will be lower than what is shown there because they always are because we have to pull them back. Um, and you know, and the revenue is very tough to change because there isn't, there, we don't have the kind of levers to change revenue. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, five, five, six years ago, we were generating over a half a million dollars in interest income on our money that we would invest, all right, during the school year as we got our taxes, all that money would go into investments. It's, it's not stocks or anything, we're not allowed to do anything like that, but it's, it's straightforward investments. We still generate over half a million dollars. Well, this year, or last year, I can tell you the number, was about $75,000. Okay, so you, again, you're getting, you're getting very little interest income because if you look at savings accounts and any kind of uh, CDs and, and short-term bonds, the interest rates are very low. Now, the flip side of that is, is that we've been borrowing quite a bit of money. So we borrowed uh, in September for our buses and for uh, a band, you know, a short-term borrowing for our project. We, the, the interest rate on that was less than a quarter of a percent. It was 0.246%. So we got the money, you know, for uh, very inexpensively. And in fact, it's much less expensive, uh, all the borrowings that we've been doing for, you know, five years now, um, than what was originally projected when we went to the public and said, this is how much it's gonna cost. That included interest rates on bands of about one and a half percent. When we're, we're, we just generate, you know, we just did this at a quarter of a percent. So on the one hand, it's great because our interest, uh, our interest cost is less, but on the flip side, our interest income is much less. So, you know, it's just part of the, part of the whole equation. So what are the conclusions? Um, I, I really I talked about this as I explain it. You know, the gap analysis is, tells us everything about what we can do uh, for instructional programs and, and, and departmental operations over the next five years. And it also tells us that, you know, in a bad year or a year that, you know, we've got a significant deficit, that you can't do things. You can't add new programs. You can't, you may have to cut programs. And that's, that's just a, a part of uh, every, every school budget that's, you know, ever built. I've been doing this for 25 years, and um, it's the same thing. It's just, um, it's been crazy the last, you know, year and a half. As, as, as Ken talks about it, because everything that you think you have a basis and a historical thing for, you don't have it anymore. And um, even when I look at when we were trying to pull together, when the business office we were trying to pull together some of these numbers, we can't really use fiscal year 2021 for certain things because they were so out of whack that they, they, were, they, they ruined the trend or they ruined, they were not a good basis. So for example, normally our buses go over 900,000 miles a year. All right, our, for the, both the deliveries and all the programs. 
Um, in that year, it was 650,000 because of what happened in the spring uh, of, you know, or, or during the whole year, rather, not the spring, that was the prior year, of less sports, less program, less, you know, some of the remote operations. It, it, dramatic changes. See, you can't use those numbers anymore because of that. So, it, it, you know, same thing with utilities. You think about our electrical and natural gas costs, you can't use that year because a lot of times the buildings weren't even, didn't have kids in them. So a lot of stuff, and it, it took a little longer because of that, but we got through it, and uh, we're very confident of these numbers. So uh, I won't read through that, but uh, that gives you, you know, kind of the ideas of everything I've said before. You know, the one thing I guess I want to do point out is this inflation thing. Everybody's talking about inflation right now. Um, that's a, that is an issue, and, um, you know, the, the assumption was within two years that the current inflation would be gone in the sense of uh, the, the, the next three years of projections. So we know that the next year or two years could see, can see, consider to see these inflationary numbers. But right now, as a school district, we haven't been majorly impacted by that. Um, our, our contract, for example, let's take food. You know, we, we actually, in a sense, through a third party, we buy a lot of food for the cafeteria. But that contract is with another company and, they've got, and we only pay them the same amount. So we're protected in that sense from what they're experiencing of these higher food costs. Um, what we're not protected from is sometimes they can't get the deliveries uh, because Cisco or some of these big operations that, that provide the food don't have bus drivers, excuse me, bus drivers, don't have drivers for the trucks to deliver. I, I get a call from our food service director saying I can't, on Monday morning I have nothing of, I, got, I have no milk because the milk trucks are not there and New York State, you know, cooperative or whoever it was doesn't have any drivers. This is the crazy stuff that's going on and, and it's happening every hour of every day at, at, at the school. So anyways, uh, we'll see how that plays out because this will change a lot, um, it, or it could change a lot, especially wages, if this continues for more than, let's say, a year, okay? So that's uh, everything I have. Um, now I would open it up for questions and discussion. From the board. I just want to sort of give a little bit of an overview of the, the process here and how this works for our newer members. Um, so you heard tonight the two presentations regarding the budget. This long range financial planning document is actually um, incredibly interesting to read and I urge people to read it over the course of the next few months, our board members to read it. And it's available for the public. But we will be thinking about next year you know, in the details of next year. And so what you're gonna see here is first high level discussions about how we support ongoing programs from the years before. Those were the slides that said, you know, this is what we had as goals for this current school year. And then you'll see how that needs to be supported and continued moving on into the next year. And then you'll get into what is going to be new for the next year. And so right now, again, it's at a very high level, it's kind of conceptual, but as we go along through our meetings, that's going to turn into the, we're going to try and hire, you know, three instructional support staff members at the elementary level. This is where we're gonna decide, you know, in terms of the physical plant, here's X amount of money that we need to spend on something new, you know, in the, in the physical facilities sort of thing. So. Um, you have to be a little bit patient to get to the, to get to the, 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 the meat of the matter, the nitty gritty, uh, you know, as we move along, but that's the progression that you're going to see. Here. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. And so anything else from the superintendent's report? That's right. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, very much. Thank you, Ken. <clears throat> All right, so we did have a policy committee meeting this evening. And first off, uh, everything I'm gonna speak about in this first part of this are work in process, okay? So these are things that are ongoing um, development. And we talked about uh, policies specifically that will support our climate and culture um, initiative here in the district. So this is the initiative, multi-year initiative 
right now there is discussion about putting together the framework putting together the steering committee starting in twenty twenty two in january there will be more detail work along with that and the district school the board's goal is that the climate and culture project is going to encompass many areas of our district it's going to encompass things like um, title nine it's going to encompass things like harassment policies it's going to encompass our code of conduct it's going to encompass wellness policies it's going to encompass the new york state regents initiative for the diversity equity and inclusion um, initiative so we just discussed in our meeting the various policies that um, could be under that umbrella and how do we communicate that out how do we keep track of that and so um, you know we specifically talked about some of our, our more important larger policies our wellness our code of conduct policy and as changes come to those or changes are proposed for those we're going to try to sort of have bundle that and have that all um, come out you know at once the code of conduct policy does require public hearings when we do make changes to that um, we talked about policies that are not uh, standalone in existence policies but are required by the state that we are in compliance with because we have language within an existing policy that covers that but we think that going forward those policies and this will be a dignity for all students policy and this will be a sexual harassment of students policy these policies will become standalone policies through the course of our work because they just need to to have more content more coverage within them uh, some of the policies we discussed from last uh, meeting um, are also going to be part of this and again we're going to make sure that we have alignment between um, the various policies that are in process now in terms of the, the work to, to either update them or implement new ones Does anyone have any questions on just that sort of general overview and how we need to have a, a framework to um, to support the policy changes that are going to be needed by this big uh, initiative by the district? Anything? Okay. In the policy folder, and this is really where um, I think we we will um, focus, and we're going to use this document a lot. So, in the policy folder. Uh, for this uh, meeting there's a PowerPoint a one page PowerPoint slide which actually um, basically is our usual design we have in the middle where we're having our climate and culture project and then all around here is where we can list the policies that um, are going to be encompassed that could be impacted by this project so this diagram will be part of the um, communications that go out regarding the climate and culture project as the project plan gets put together this document will go along with it so that our board members and the public everyone can see what policies are being considered um, under the umbrella of this project and then of course this will um, be modified as needed as the project goes along so I encourage everybody to look for this and this is the way in a one page document to keep track of um, all these policies that could be impacted and in the future we could be discussing at meetings as needing revisions or needing implementation if it's a new policy okay uh, lastly i'm just going to talk about a policy that we are um, going to have action upon so uh, we discussed our policy 1510 which is our regular board meetings and rules policy so this is an existing policy it's on the district website it's in the policy folder that we have in our shared drives and so the updates that we want to make to this are to um, just put in language about the 
posting of the documents for our meeting. So we do this today. This is our practice that the, um, the documents and the resolutions are posted for the public's um, viewing at least 24 hours before the meeting, but we didn't have that documented within the policy. So there are two places where we just want to um, include that language. And then we just wanted to, um, oh, and then there are two places where, uh, as you hear me, when we talk about our public comment, and public comment is covered under policy 1510, the guidance and the, the things that I talk about before the public comment period happens, that is in the policy here. And we just want to add language, which is actually really just a reinforcement of what is already in there that just says all participants are required to comply with the district code of conduct. Okay, so anything that's in the district code of conduct is also already in the policy, such as, you know, um, speakers will not use profane, vulgar, threatening, or disparaging language. This is just boilerplate to basically reinforce our code of conduct. That's what um, we expect our speakers, just as we expect our staff, we expect our students, we expect all members of our community to follow. So that is in there. Additionally, we want to add a couple of detail items regarding the public comment and the um, part of the support for this comes from the New York State School Boards Association. So they um, recently published a public comment guide which um, is a restatement of some things that the New York State School Boards had already shared association already shared, but also has a few new things in here. And um, I'm gonna get these hard copies for everyone. This um, was given out at the Saratoga County School Board Association meeting I attended last week. But um, I will get a hard copy of this for everyone, so we'll have them. Um, and uh, these are with the changes, and so, this is actually something that I'm presenting. I am interested in your thoughts and comments. Uh, uh, in the policy committee, it is the committee's um, recommendation that we include these in here, but this is absolutely the chance for us to discuss and, and get feedback on them. So first um, thing is there will be language which will um, talk about a total time limit for each of the public comment periods. So the recommendation from the New York State School Boards Association, many other districts have this, is a 30 minute total of public comment that would allow for 15 speakers. You can tell from your experience, we've never reached 15 speakers. Um, but if for some reason there was a item that uh, there could have been more speakers, we need to have some limit on that just so it doesn't take over the meeting. We can conduct the, the board's business. Um, the second item is uh, language which uh, states that the first public comment period will be limited to comment on agenda items that have been posted publicly, that have been out there for everyone to see. And then the second public comment period will be for uh, an open comment period for items that are not on the agenda and the resolutions. I think this supports the board's um, operations, the board being able to have its meeting. If we have comment on items that are on the agenda, that are resolutions for the specific meeting, we can have that comment, but if not, we can go through, get to our resolutions, conduct that business, and then have the open part of our meeting afterwards. The reality of this is that we, if both of these were initiated, we would have 30 minutes of time, up to 15 speakers to comment on agenda items. Then we would allow for 30 minutes of time, up to 15 um, speakers 
uh, for open comment period uh, time, and that would just again be at the, the second um, thing. I, I think this, I think this supports our community, allows still for for open um, discussion, but somewhat structures our meeting so that we can get through the the bulk of our our business um, before we get to a, a truly um, uh, or if we get to a public comment period on on any item. So. I'm very much interested in comment thoughts. Um, just to clarify, from the meeting, I thought it was a thir total of 30 minutes. But it was 30 minutes. I, I, I was under the opinion assumption that we would allow a 30 minute for the first public comment period, a 30 minute for the second public comment period. but. <laughs> I am certainly open to suggestions, thought. Um, but I don't know. What do you think it should be? Other thoughts? Are we going to limit time frame in any other section? So, you know, for me, when we're going through, if uh, if it's unlimited every other section, we're only going to limit one. Uh, you know, I can see some concerns in that. Okay. Thank so if you, we're ta if we're talking, uh, trying to get through a, a program and an agenda, and keep everything on time, uh, shouldn't we have sections with time limits in total? so that it's all treated fairly as we work through it. If we just take the public comment section and narrow that down, it seems a little unfair to me. Okay, thank you. I'll respond in a second, but other no comments, worries. thoughts? Okay, so there is guidance related to our presentations um, that are given two here which come under the superintendent's report right they come under the superintendent's report there is guidance and time um, time parameters put around that there is not time parameters put on any other part of the meeting um, I'm somewhat going on historical knowledge and and Dottie I think you have the most historical knowledge of all of us uh, the original thought of 30 minutes for the first public comment period, 30 minutes for the second public comment, we've never had an hour public comment period ever in my recollection. Um, and I, I guess if, if the community had a reason for more than that, I think we could take that as a, you know, a discussion item, a, a can we make an exception? Is this something that is important enough to have its own public forum for comment, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that was kind of what, where I was going, Katie, with not having it be 30 minutes in total. Again, having 30 minutes at the first, 30 minutes at the second, that gives us that full hour of public comment. Again, historically, that has served the community you know, and, and it's neat. So I was not disagreeing with you uh, 30 and 30. I was just clarifying. Oh, yeah. um, and that was my misunderstanding from the policy committee meeting, yeah. which I apologize for. No, it's fine. Right, and, and the purpose of the policy, again, is to support the board in conducting its business at the public meeting. Um, you know, this meeting is held in public. It allows for public viewing and it allows for public comment, but the, you know, it's the board's meeting. It's the meeting for us to conduct our business. So I've surfaced this. I will um, 
uh, ask if uh, anyone has any additional thoughts to that to just share them um, to me via email and we'll go forward with um, what the uh, proposed update is going to be for this. We would like this to be um, put in place so that we can have a first reading on January 5th. The language that's decided upon will be available for our board members um, prior to then so that you can review and have comment on um, well before that first reading on the first and that will be you know feedback to the policy committee. Does that work for everyone? Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. That's all I have for policy committee. Uh, next up is correspondence, superintendent correspondence to the district. Uh, eight general topics for us. Um, Twitter account blocking. We've had some correspondence with an individual on that. Um, it is easy, I think, for our staff, for example, who is reporting, who are reporting on uh, uh, musical events, reading activities, etc. And then when a comment is made, um, again, for, for music, a recent one was the muzzles, the masking, um, really out of place and, and quite frankly, c confusing comments relative to what's being posted. Uh, the back and forth with the individual uh, on this one in particular stated to me that the, the purpose of the comments are to be provocative and to be hyperbolic to try to get a response from people. Um, by letter of the law, we cannot block those from district accounts. Uh, so we try to have conversations with individuals within the community that, again, our staff members are serving our children, trying to do the very best they can in bringing uh, that out. When you see some of those types of posts that are immaterial to what's uh, being put up by the teachers, that's challenging for us. And so we continue to work with individuals to try to give them a more appropriate forum uh, to share their comments, such as, for example, coming to a board meeting. Um, there was a, a student PE injury and questions on the administrative oversight, change to the masking requirement uh, that we've had some back and forth on, as Jason noted, uh, school safety in light of the Oxford, Michigan High School tragedy, uh, still going on tonight based on the message that we sent out earlier. Um, the enrollment impact of the growth within uh, the district. You can drive to a variety of areas and you still see uh, incredible residential growth happening. Good questions on what the impact is. Uh, we were able to share our enrollment study. We share our long range financial plan. Uh, vaccination clinics and the availability. Questions on the bus driver shortage. Uh, and then social media posts by students. Uh, we had an incident or a set of incidents uh, with that last week that I reported to the board on. Those are the general topics for correspondence this, this time. Ken, I have a question. Um, so via the um, Twitter comments, or um, so if a teacher has a personal Twitter account or an administrator and they post something about school, mm -hmm. um, a great activity, a concert, gym class, whatever, or physical education, does that then become a district account where they're held responsible? In each of the situations, uh, the individual, it was a, a teacher account, but it wasn't their personal account. It was directly associated with the district, and so uh, we can't block people from that unless there's clearly offensive material in there uh, that, again, doesn't pass the reasonable test. Okay, and so just to clarify, what makes the account um, under the district account when you identify uh, you're either listed uh, Boston Spa you know fourth grade teacher Boston Spa oh, okay. PE teacher right. business official okay good uh, where time. there's a very clear linkage to the district okay all right great thank you the uh, there was no uh, correspondence directly to the board in the last two weeks announcements mr. Williams Still waiting for the game show host music to kind Ryan. of chime in. <laughs> cue, cue, the, cue the music. The, uh, this afternoon, the Global Foundries Town of Malta Foundation uh, presented their community grants to organizations that, that serve the town of Malta. 
Um, the district was included in that. There were 24 grants, about $160,000 handed out this afternoon. And the district was awarded 19,000 for four specific projects. Uh, the high school received $4,000 for the after prom event in the spring. The middle school drama club received $2,500 for the winter musical that they're, they're producing now and getting ready for the SpongeBob musical. Um, the, our partnership fund received a $10,000 grant for our, the robotics program. So we got that um, district wide to use for the robotics program and the Gordon Creek PTA uh, received $2,500 for their reading program and bringing in a, a visiting author. Um, they'll at some point we'll get some follow up on that and learn some more about the different things that are happening. The Malta Food Fest was held last Wednesday. Um, we sold just about the 200 tickets that, that it was set up for and along with the silent auction is going to raise between five and six thousand somewhere in there um, they're still tallying up the money um, so we needed to thank kelly elliott and adrian snow um, they basically coordinated it for the district and hosted the event out at TechSmart. and the robotics team students actually came and helped run the the food out to the cars as people were picking it up um, as well as we need to thank the Saratoga County Chamber. Um, they actually are partnering with us to do it. They do all the legwork, they do the ticket sales, they're handling the money, and that's why um, we don't have the final numbers quite yet. Um, but they, they will come with a check presentation like we've done in, in years past, so we'll have them in um, later this spring. Um, and then finally, just to remind people not to miss the winter concerts. We've already had some throughout the last two weeks, and there's two more to go. Uh, tomorrow night's the varsity concert here at the high school, um, which is the jazz band, the symphonic orchestra, the festival choir, and the wind ensemble. Um, and then next week is the sixth grade concert on the 21st. So again, that's here in the auditorium. So that's it. Thank you, Stuart. Any other announcements from the district? No, sir. Uh, one clarifying point, Jasonson. Um, we just sent out an additional message tonight. This is relative to the generalized school threat uh, that's traveling around the country right now. Uh, we sent out a clarifying note, Stuart sent it probably 10 minutes ago. There is no specific threat to our schools. This is a threat in general. Students were talking about this today, so we wanted to make sure parents were aware of the information. We asked them to have conversations uh, with their children, really emphasizing that you know if you, if you see something, if you hear something, um, you have to say something to us. But again, there is no specific threat uh, to any of our school students or staff at this time. It was a generalized threat. Is there any knowledge right now as to the origin of this? I mean, it could have come from anywhere in That's the country exactly right. or the world. It's, it's, a, it's, it's on the internet. Yeah, the, the state police uh, intel unit as well as Saratoga County Police, uh, Sheriff's Office intel unit, uh, they are aware of this, they're tracking it. Uh, there was, for example, a, a news program yesterday, I believe, out of Los Angeles, focusing on this as well, so it, it truly is countrywide. I don't know as though we'll be able to find the origin of it. It's, right. it's on TikTok, but that's why we invited parents, students, let, let's make sure we're having conversations, reporting any, any issues that are out of the norm. Right, and, but just again to emphasize, no specific known threat within our region to our school district That's correct. has been identified. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Any announcements from board members? I just want to touch base on um, last Monday on 12-6, the Saratoga County School Boards Association meeting happened, and uh, there was a board president roundtable talking about challenges and success stories so far this school year. The board presidents of the Saratoga City School District, the Waterford Half Moon uh, District, and the South Glens Falls District all spoke, and uh, it, was, it was great. And I, I encourage our board members to attend the next um, meeting of the Saratoga County School Boards Association. Any member is welcome to that. And it is on Monday, January 24th. It's at the Holiday Inn in Saratoga. And the program is having uh, two of the law firms that provide counsel to districts are going to do a, a presentation on legal matters um, related to our, our current environment and to school districts in general. So just want to share that that is upcoming in January. Do we have any old business? Not hearing any. We are on to our new business. 
I have a motion to approve resolution number 313, adoption of the district-wide safety plan. Second. Second. Any discussion? Not hearing any. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Resolution passes. I have a motion to approve resolution number 314, agreement, Village of Valston Spa. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Uh, I just want to add, this is in regards to having the skating rink at the Eastern Avenue rec fields that's been there for decades and decades and decades, and it's wonderful to partner with the village on the skating rink. And to follow on that, uh, kudos to Brian Siriani for the work that he's done on that, uh, very patiently working through uh, a sometimes challenging uh, item. So thank you, Brian. Not hearing any more. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Resolution passes. I have a motion to approve resolution number 315, acceptance of donation. So moved. Second. Any discussion? I would just like to say thank you again to the Boston Spa Education Foundation for everything that they have done for the district. Uh, these two grants, I know, brought it up to quite a bit of money that they have uh, received grants for that they've given us um, the different members of our school district and it's very important and keeps so many different programs going here here we've done thank yous again and again and again and we'll continue for our <laughs> the, education uh, foundation more to come they have subsequently approved additional grants on that so holly and team will be back uh, for more yeah, that's donations a good thing. wonderful all right all those in favor aye, aye. aye. opposed Abstentions. Resolution number 315 passes. I have a motion to approve resolution number 316, placement of students with disabilities. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Not hearing any. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Resolution number 316 passes. I have a motion to approve resolution number 317, placement of preschool students with disabilities. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Not hearing any. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Resolution number 317 passes. I have a motion to approve resolution, uh, resolutions 318, 3 through 3 are recognized as consent agenda for the purpose of the Board of Education action. We have a motion to approve resolutions number 318 through 333, the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Any discussion? As the board saw in their justification from Mrs. Motler, uh, we are thrilled that a number of our folks uh, are actually stepping out of current positions uh, into more promotional level positions. So uh, love to be able to do that for our team and grateful that they are continuing to step forward. And do we have any of those appointments here present so we can recognize them? Mrs. Motler or any of our appointees here this evening? <laughs> Dr. Duca is, is on the list again to assist us with special education uh, and has done yeoman's work in uh, managing that at 612. Dr. Duca continued thanks for that. Okay. Any other comments? Not hearing any. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? <laughs> Resolutions 318 through 333, the consent agenda passes. Uh, we do have a couple of items under other new business tonight. The first is you should have a letter from the New York State Education Department. That's the black and white copy. We have the hard copy in front of you. So, um, and, and first of all, full disclosure, I sit on the board of the, um, the Wish We Boces. But the uh, superintendent of the Wish We Boces is announcing his retirement. So part of the process from the state education department is that at that time they do a re review of the components of the Boces, of the mission of the Boces, et cetera, and come up with these options and ask that each of the component school districts make a determination as to which of the options that they support. 
So option one is to make no change. Option two is to transfer um, school districts from the BOCES to another BOCES, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Option three is to transfer school districts to a neighboring BOCES. So how is that different from two? I'm sorry, Ken. Actually, one is a transfer in, the other is a transfer out. Thank you. So option one is to keep it the same. Option two is to transfer out. No, it's transfer in. Option three is to transfer out. And option four is to merge the entire BOCES um, supervisory district with another contiguous supervisory district. Um, so I think the only background I can give you, uh, Ken, you've shared that um, you know, from your viewpoint, the BOCES are pretty much as consolidated as they can be. Um, uh, my opinion is our district has no um, interest in changing its affiliation. Yeah with the BOCES at this time. Um, so I think that makes option one our uh, recommendation back to the State Education Department. But I wanted to bring this up. This is the time for our board to give differing opinions, ask clarifying questions. What do we got? Anything? I mean, I'll be honest, I, I don't know what that means. To be honest with you, so when you talk option two, option three. So for example, we have 31 component school districts within our BOCES, uh, ranging from Newcomb to the north to Waterford Half Moon to the south. What we did in our discussion as superintendents this last week, uh, we put the question on the table, do any of our uh, districts who are on the borders, uh, for example, Galway could go over to HFM BOCES if they felt there was an advantage uh, to their students and their taxpayers. Uh, Newcomb and Minerva could go up, for example, to um, the Malone BOCES uh, or into the Plattsburgh BOCES. Waterford Half Moon could go down to Capital Region BOCES. There's a variety of reasons why, why districts may choose to do that. Uh, no one voiced any interest in that. So uh, as a, a group of 31, we are interested in staying uh, the 31. Um, otherwise, if there were districts who felt that they wanted to explore this further, then it goes into a year-long study process uh, that's facilitated by the Rockefeller Institute to see if, in fact, there are efficiencies, there are advantages, disadvantages to students and taxpayers. Um, because of the fact that we are so uh, large geographically, uh, we can work with scale because of the number of students that we have, because of the diversity of districts that we have, quite frankly. Uh, the larger districts, uh, us, uh, South Glens Falls, uh, certainly Saratoga, uh, we are on the, the high end of enrollment, and then you have Newcomb with 70 students uh, at the low end. But within that diversity, uh, this works very well for all of our students. Uh, and so that's why, from an administrative perspective, we recommend option one. Appreciate it. Th does that help, Wayne? Yeah, it sure does. Okay. <laughs> right, and, and the inquiry from the State Education Department is to each of the component Correct. school districts. So. I think this gives us the opportunity and th this is our voice so if we knew of a school district that potentially had a challenge with being in the BOCES it would be the time for us to raise that as well that is not the case that is not the case I think to any of our our knowledge is as Ken said in, in the shared meeting amongst the superintendents folks are happy with keeping it the size it is right now um, that's why, again, we don't have any knowledge of any reason to make changes. So my question is, the uh, survey that needs to be done, that means that you need to make the survey. This isn't something that each one of us has to go on and do. That's correct. Go I, on, I and have do. To, on behalf of the board, and we can do that either through the affirmative nod or we put this on uh, as an actual resolution at the next meeting. And I defer to the chair on that one. Right, and, and my first thought was that we would have this be a resolution in the January 5th meeting. That way it gets that this is our mm -hmm. public opinion, this is our review, gives us time to review this, think about it, any changes we want to make. Uh, it doesn't matter, I think, one way or another if we do a nod or we do the public resolution. I, I think the public resolution is the way to go. It's my, my humble opinion. And the deadline is, is January 7th, so if we put it on as a resolution, we're uh, within the time frame for the State Education Department. I think that the public uh, is, is the good way to go because we do have many new members here on the board, and it gives them a chance to ask any questions if they have any on the BOCES. I mean, I know my 
my own opinion is is that I'm all for change if needed but if 31 superintendents are saying that they do not need a change then I defer to their expertise but this gives everyone a chance to ask questions sure and if there are any follow-up mm -hmm. questions from anyone please address them to uh, myself and the superintendent yeah. in the interim <clears throat> The other item for uh, other new business is the colored um, item you have here. So uh, as um, superintendent has shared in the, uh, the, the postings on the website in some of our responses um, to uh, the Scotty Scoop questions and responses um, from our community, uh, the recent um, announcements from the governor uh, really did not take into account any kind of voice or survey or input from school districts. So many school districts, many superintendents are putting together a letter to be shared with our state representatives, sharing our viewpoint on that. This is a letter that um, the superintendent has put together and uh, we have talked about making it a joint letter from both the superintendent and the school board, but we wanted to um, surface that here, get your input on that. Uh, this is not um, incredibly time sensitive and that we want to send it you know, tomorrow at 9 a.m. We would like, I think, to have it together and out at some point. And I think you shared there are both a collective letter from many superintendents being drafted uh, within our region and then also individual letters from specific school districts and uh, superintendent and boards as well. So I think this gives us a chance to um, go on record and get that in there. So uh, I'm not necessarily asking you to read and um, decide right this moment, but that is the plan, that is the direction that we would like to go in. I absolutely support us having this um, uh, put together. I think it, I, I like the idea of having it be in partnership with the administration and the superintendent and kind of having one voice from our, our district go out there. So are there any initial thoughts, questions um, regarding the letter or the, the idea of, of drafting and, and sending the letter? Yes. Uh, yes, I, I did read the letter earlier today. I think it's uh, well, well written. And uh, we would like to get the body of evidence of why they made this decision. So I think it is well worth um, the effort of sending it. Yeah, basically to reiterate what he's saying, it, it's absolutely reasonable to ask for this body of evidence to understand why this decision was made and, you know, get, get to the bottom of it and, you know, definitely reasonable to ask it and I, I would definitely be uh, on board with the board would like, would like to sign along with it as well. And because she's such a close partner with the district, I do have a meeting at 9.30 on Friday morning with Assemblywoman Warner, uh, where I want to walk her through this. Um, again, she has uh, been so helpful in so many of the initiatives that we've worked with. This will be the second conversation that we've had with her. Um, and so I will report back to the board on uh, any outcomes from that meeting. Okay. Thank you. I think it's all. I think it's also a good idea with what you were saying, Jason, that to have at least maybe uh, have the board president signature also just saying, you know, in support of the entire board, the board president, so that they also know that the board is the same, agrees with the everything in the letter. Thank you. I agree as well. I think it's very important that we take this to the legislator and the governor and talk to as many people in Albany as possible mm -hmm. and try to get these answers that not only our students deserve but our community members deserve as well. Yeah, well said, Kate. Okay, so um, uh, I would say then during the course of tomorrow we'll have an updated version reflecting the authorship from both the board and the, um, the, the district and uh, look for that and then we'll try and have this uh, finalized by tomorrow afternoon and then can as he states can share it with the representative warner friday morning 
okay? okay. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we are at the time in our meeting, second time for public comment. Do we have anyone signed up for public comment? Mr. Williams. Okay, uh, everyone was here for the prior public comment period when I shared, so <coughs> we can start. Uh, with Mr. Dubuque, Chris Dubuque. Thank you, everyone. The proposal for the two public comments for the 30 minutes, um, one to address the agenda and one to address uh, public concerns. Uh, just some food for thought with that. If you do go that route, maybe have the first 30 minute uh, session not to address so much the agenda, but to address what the public has or their concern may be that they want to bring to the attention of the board. Uh, as you can tell, there's people that will often get up in the middle of the meeting and leave uh, that have concerns that they want to bring to the board's attention. They have young children at home. Uh, they may have to get up early the next day for work. I understand that's also the same with many board members as well. So you can definitely uh, understand where they are as parents. Um, the rest of us, we tend to stick around. I like to hear what goes on in the meeting and then try to address what goes on in the meeting as well. Uh, just a little structural uh, suggestion. I've been to a couple board meetings with a couple schools. Um, you know, again, I, I uh, applaud this school's efforts. Uh, I've never been disrespected coming up here. I, I'd love to say that that stands in all districts. Unfortunately, it doesn't. Um, so again, thank you for that. Uh, so just just a suggestion with regards to how you structure your public comment with what would be addressed in each 30 minute section. Uh, it does work pretty well for other school districts I've seen. And then usually the last one, um, you know, there's not so much that 30 minute limit there, but they do put 30 minute limit in the beginning. So it's not getting disruptive to what needs to be brought up on the agenda. Uh, also, with that being said, just to address one of the topics tonight, one of the things that was uh, expressed is the budget. Um, when you start talking labor market information, that is my bread and butter. Uh, that's also a concern, and that's something we're tracking as well at the county level and at the state level, unfortunately. And it is a concern, as you can see, with some of the parents that came here, including parents to themselves who are vaccinated, but their children are not, and they're worried of what's going to happen uh, with mandates possibly coming down for vaccines, as well as just some of the language out there encouraging as was said, uh, vaccinated students to room with other vaccinated students. Um, unfortunately, that pushes people away from the district, it pushes people away from the county, it pushes people away from the state. Uh, and unfortunately, we're seeing that in the labor market right now. It's concerning. Uh, it's something that we bring up daily. Uh, truck drivers was mentioned. I know some trucking companies have vaccine requirements on their employees. They're losing employees. Um, I've also reached out. Uh, please utilize us, uh, Saratoga Employment uh, and Training. Uh, Jennifer McClowski, she's wonderful. Please reach out to her. We would be more than happy. We have a Facebook page. We would get your information up there for bus drivers, substitute teachers, teachers. Uh, we can get the word out there for you. There's WIOA funding to get the CDL training. I know this district provides the CDL training to bus drivers, but that WIOA funding please. would be just save on the budget. Uh, and again, would highly recommend that. We would just get the word out and further uh, help the school out. Uh, one last thing quickly, just to put in there, I did want to thank the uh, winter concerts uh, you may not realize that you know when you have four children you see all kinds of aspects with children uh, my oldest who recently graduated from Boston Spa he was more of a, a introvert but when he had a chance to get up there on stage and play his violin uh, a whole other person came out and it, there's just nothing like being up on that stage in the auditorium for a young man uh, or young woman to express themselves so again thank you for uh, you know pushing for that to be again in the auditorium uh, much appreciated thank you Thank you for your comments. Uh, next up on our list, Lisa Donovan. Please state your name and address. Hi there, I'm Lisa Donovan. I live on Middle Line Road in Boston Spa. Um, I just wanted to make a comment or, or a statement about this new mask mandate. Um, the mask situation is already very stressful for the kids in school. Um, my son is in middle school, you know, he comes home almost every day telling me, you know, about the different times he got yelled at during the day for his mask, you know, whether, um, you know, it slipped off his nose by accident or, you know, he may be looking down in the hallway and the teacher walking by didn't see the mask on her nose. So she says, you know, is your mask on your face the right way? 
Or maybe he did actually take his mask down for a second to breathe for a couple of seconds of breath, you know, fresh air. Um, you know, the fact of the matter is, is it's putting a lot of stress on the kids because they're constantly getting yelled at about these masks. And, um, you know, I realize I'm hearing this from a 12 year old and it's very possible he's not getting yelled at all day long about his mask. But even if it's just once or twice a day, that's really kind of messed up. Um, you know, we're yelling at kids for not wearing a mask, or actually they are wearing their masks. They're not wearing them properly. You know, um, his friend on Monday got a lunch detention because his mask was under his nose. You know, so I didn't even know there were lunch detentions, so that shows how old I am, I guess. But, um, you know, so the one free period where they don't have to wear their mask full time, lunch, he is in lunch detention because his mask was under his nose. And I'm just sitting here like, how did we get to this place? I mean, in an effort to try to protect our kids, we've arrived at this place that's dysfunctional and dystopian, really. And it's just adding this extra layer of stress and anxiety to the already there stress of being in school. I mean, all of us have been in middle school, high school, there's already stress there. And this whole mask thing is really just an additional weight around their necks. So, you know, this additional mandate now is just bringing us to another level. And, um, you know, what is gonna happen now if a kid tries to take a breath of fresh air during the day, you know, at, during their six or seven hour long school day to take a couple of breaths of fresh air, are they gonna end up in lunch detention? This is just crazy. And, you know, I wanted to thank you, the district, because at the beginning of the school year, or actually late summer, you were going through a process of figuring out what are we gonna do with masks in the schools? What is the policy gonna be? Are they gonna, you know, or should kids be allowed to wear a mask only in hallways and not wear a mask in the classrooms? Um, you were going through that whole period. You were asking for parent input, and I really appreciated that very much. Um, I thought that was great because these decisions really should be made at the local level, you know, with parent input, administrator, teacher input, all that. And that's where that decision belonged. And unfortunately, the governor took that decision making ability away from us at the beginning of the school year. And now, this is an attempt to take another decision away. It's a tiny little thing, mask breaks during a six or seven hour long day. But it's so important to these kids, it really is. And I really thank the Saratoga Board of Supervisors because they gave us a way out of it. And I really hope that we can do that and do what's best for the children. My mask is slipping down as I'm talking. I can understand how these kids are getting yelled at all day. If you can conclude. I just urge the board and the district to take advantage of what the Board of Supervisors <coughs> did. And I kind of lost that's this letter that you were just talking about. Is that was that for the mask mandate or was that for something else that you that were? That was in response. It was. To okay, so thank thing. you very much for that. And you know, if you, if you can't end up allowing the kids to take mask breaks during their long day, I really think that you need to provide full-time remote learning as an option until this goes away. Um, and I really, I believe that in-person learning is what's best for the kids, for sure, but um, not under these artificially stressful conditions. It's just, it's, it's crazy, it's just too hard, and I think they need a break, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. So um, now we come time for a comment from our Teachers Association and ATA. I want to start that out by sharing that I received a... Um... Um, excuse me, I was up. Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, Jason Durkin, our third comment. My apologies. So Chris kind of beat me to the punch. I really just, uh, I think that the second comment period should be more for reactionary uh, after hearing and seeing presentations and learning about policy changes and such. Um, you talk about limiting time per session. As you can see tonight, we didn't really have a need for a half hour session. Um, I think putting a predetermined limit on a comment section as far as time goes, um, I, I don't know that that works. What happens when you do have a major concern and you have a good portion of the community comes, are you gonna limit it to 15 people, the first 15 people to sign up to speak? I don't think that's fair. 
to touch on the long-term financial, Brian did a good job presenting. Thank you. Um, you. You did start off saying something about having a hard time finding aides and drivers. Uh, and you said, I, I, I don't know why. Well, I can tell you why, and I think that you all know why. I think it's because employees of the district have to be vaccinated or they have to test out. Nobody wants to come to work for a place that requires that. I get it, your hands are tied, but you know, you're not very transparent with the public when you are expressing concern in this kind of a situation. And lastly, last week, or last meeting, excuse me, uh, it was, Rosa Parks was lamented by a particular board member about her part in ending segregation. But here we are discussing segregation, vaccinated versus unvaccinated. So I ask, do the unvaccinated kids have to now sit in the proverbial back of the bus? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. River. My apologies again for skipping over you in the, the sign-up sheet. Okay, now we're at the time for um, comments from our associations. And uh, I received a communication from uh, Ms. McGowan and uh, from the, the assistant teachers associations. And she just says that on behalf of the BSATA, I would like to wish the Board of Education and our community a very safe, healthy, and happy holiday. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much for that communication, Ms. McGowan. Do we have anyone from the TA or CSEA? I do not see anyone now. Okay. Any updates from the PTA? No. Any final comment, question from the board members? In that case, may I have a motion to adjourn? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you very much, everyone.